OK, so um, we can turn to. H10. Did I go over part C with you with um, with H of T? No, we started. OK, all right, good. So um, yeah, so let me walk through that process. Um, see if this makes sense to you. OK, so we have uh, rates that um, snow is falling on the ground. We also have a rate in which um, Janet is removing snow from the ground. OK, so there's two things going on. Um, so uh, we have to understand that G of T is telling us how fast she's moving. She's doing 125 cubic feet per hour for one hour, and then she's doing 108 cubic feet per hour for two hours. Um, but then H of T is going to be a, uh, an equation, a um, piecewise function that's going to uh, tell us exactly how much she's accomplished up to that moment in time. So if it's like 630 or 730, can we create a formula where we know exactly how much you know she's um, uh, she's shoveled off of the driveway? So um, let's go ahead and see if we can build out H of T. But let's just think in terms of um, let's just do this from an easy perspective here. Um, how much is she going to do at, at 6 a.m. by 6 a.m.? Nothing, right? She hasn't she hasn't started yet. What about at 7 a.m.? How much snow will she have shoveled off the ground? Exactly 125 cubic feet, right? Um, but this is the rate. But if it's 630, then it's going to be half that, right? The 615, it'll be a fourth of that. What about um, by 8 a.m., how much would she have accomplished by 8 a.m.? Yeah, because you do 125 plus 108, right? So the so the whole numbers are easy, right? If we're just given, if we're just figuring out, you know, hour wise, you know, we can just add up those numbers. What about by 9 a.m.? Okay, 125 plus 108 plus 108. Why 108 twice? Because it's two hours. Because it's two hours, right? So 125 cubic feet per hour, then 100 cubic feet for this for the second hour, and 100 cubic feet for the third hour. The only thing practice with right, right. So let's um, if we're just doing whole numbers, that's easy, right? We just either do add 125 plus 108 plus 108. Uh, but if it's like a fraction, if it's like 6.30 or 7.30 or 8.30, then um, then it gets a little bit more involved. So um, let's see if we can build a formula that can handle um, fractions or uh, a, a time that is not exactly at on the hour. Okay. So um, here's what we can do. H of T is equal to so the first part, the first portion is easy because we know she hasn't done anything in the six in the, from midnight until 6 a.m. So we know H of T is still going to be zero from zero to six. Okay. But then from six to seven, we know that she's going to be working at this rate. Um, but if it's less than an hour, there's going to be a, only a fractional portion of that rate. So let's do this. We know that from six until T, and we know T is going to be some number seven or less. She's working at a rate of 125. Right. So if we accumulate that rate. Let's create a formula out of it. Well, let's work this problem out, and then we can have something to put in this space. So if I were to evaluate this integral here, what that looks like? 125 turns into what? 125. What's power rule for 125? Well, that's derivative, right? What's what's power rule for antiderivative? 
125x. Yeah. So with antiderivative, right, we're increasing the degree by one. So 125x. And then we do what? Plug in the bounds, right? What bound goes in first? Um, the six or the T? Upper bound first, right? We always do upper bound first. Okay, so 125 times T, then what? Minus 125 times six. Okay, if I factor that 125 out, I get 125 times T minus six. So this is the progress that she's going to make any time between six and seven. Let's test it out. 125 parentheses T minus six or anything between six and seven. We test it out. Let's see if this works. At 6 a.m., it'll be six minus six, which is zero, which is exactly um, zero, right? Nothing has happened at, at six. At seven, seven minus six is one. She goes, she's going to do exactly 125 cubic feet. What if it's 6.5? 6.5 would be 630. 6.5 minus six is what? 0.5. And then half of 125, that's exactly, if she's doing 125 cubic feet per hour, then half of that will be what she's accomplished by 630. Okay, so uh, we're convinced that any time that we insert in decimal form between six and seven, we're going to get some fractional percentage of that of that uh, hourly rate. Now, between seven and nine, she's working at a different rate, right? She's working at 108 cubic feet um, per hour. So let's figure that out. So from seven until T, and T can be any number between seven and nine, she's working at a rate of 108 PX. So we want to find out how much she's shoveled. We can go through this formula, right? This is the rate. We're going to accumulate that rate over a, a time period. So what does 108 turn into? Mm -hmm. And then we evaluate between T and 7. Right? So 108 times T minus 108 times 7. Factor that 108 out. If we get T minus 7. So that's our formula to tell us what she's done in that two hour time period. Let's test it out to see if this makes sense. So at seven, oops, sorry, uh, I missed something here. Because at 7 a.m., what would she have done at 7 a.m.? 125, right? So it's gonna be 125 plus however much progress she's going to make after 7 a.m., right? Because at 7 a.m., she would have already accomplished 125 because 125 for one hour, right? And then so it's going to be 125 plus, and this is the progress she's going to make from 7 to 9. It's going to be 108 times T minus 7. If I plugged in 8, it'll be exactly 125 plus 108. If it's 9, then it'll be 125 plus 108 times 2, so 125 plus 108 plus 108. But if it's a decimal version between 7 and 9, if it's 7, 7.5 or 8.5, it'll just be some percentage of that 108. And we add that together, and that's going to tell us exactly what she's done up to that time. And it's a little, this is a little bit harder, um, but I think it's good for us to kind of see um, some of these problems and, and see how they apply uh, for, um, for these uh, rating rate outs. Okay, so now part D. How many cubic feet of snow are on the driveway at 9 a.m.? So snow is falling and she's working to get the snow off the ground. So what can we do to figure out how much snow is on the ground at 9 a.m.? What factors do we have to include? Is snow still falling at 9 a.m.? Yes, from midnight to 9 a.m., snow accumulates on the driveway. So what can we do to figure out how much snow has fallen for that nine-hour period? Mm -hmm. Can we just insert nine into f of t? Take the antiderivative, right? We want cubic feet. We don't want cubic feet per hour. So the uh, integral from zero to nine 
of f of t, this will give us how much snow has fallen on the ground in that nine hour period. And then how much snow has she taken off the ground by 9 a.m.? Janet. And we said it before, right? 125 plus. Mm -hmm. 125 plus 108 plus 108. Yeah, so three hours worth of work is going to give us 341. So minus 341. So this is how much snow is on the ground has accumulated. This is how much she's removed from the ground. And if we put that in the calculator, Uh, that'll get us 26.334. So she's made good progress. Uh, by 6 a.m., it was uh, 442 cubic feet. Um, but through the work that she did in the next three hours, she was able to get it all the way down to 26, even while snow was continuing to fall um, between 6 and 9. And probably not, it's like not possible for it to be a negative answer either. Uh, exactly, right, right. It can't be a negative, she, because she's not going to shovel snow once it's clear, right? So, yeah, you're right. You're, you're expecting a positive number, right? OK, any questions with seven and eight? OK, so today uh, let's work through. Um, actually, I'm going to uh, have you guys try 11 and 12 on your own later. I do want to make sure that we can still recall uh, differential equations because that's going to be on the quiz next week as well. So. Um, Tonight's homework or tonight today's uh, uh, goal is to get between 11 to 14. So let me skip 11 and 12 since these are just more um, rate in rate out problems that we can try on our own. Uh, let's do a solving differential equation on page 13. And so this is where we have to um, separate the variables, right? And then, uh, okay. So we, we may have seen this already, but I think it's good for us to, to practice these types of problems. This is um, what a common uh, differential equation could look like uh, from an FRQ standpoint. So at the beginning of 2010, a landfill contains 1,400 tons of solid waste. The increasing function W models the total amount of solid waste stored at the landfill. Now we don't have the function W, but we do have Differential equation dwdt, which tells us the rate at which uh, waste is accumulating um, at the landfill. Okay, so it's following this formula here. W is measured in tons. P is measured in years from 2010. So part A says use a line tangent to the graph of W at t equals zero to approximate the amount of solid waste when that landfill contains at the end of the first um, three months. So we're going to basically do um, a linear approximation. So we're going to build our tangent line, and then we're going to plug in that one fourth. Okay. So if we think about tangent line equation, this is what it looks like, right? Typically, it's um, y minus y one is equal to m times x minus x one. But our variables are going to be different in this problem. Instead of x, what's our independent variable? T, yeah. Instead of Y, we're going to use what? W, yeah. So let's build, let's uh, rebuild the equation that we're going to be doing. It's going to be W minus W sub 1 is equal to M times T minus T sub 1. So instead of replacing Y1, X1 with an order pair, we're going to replace T1, W1 with order pair, and then the slope is going to come from DW, DT. Okay, so let's see if we can build our point. So our point is zero comma what? Yeah, good. zero comma fourteen hundred. 
That's our T and that's our W. Um, we can build our slope by putting it into our DWDT. That's our slope formula. So we just insert 1400. It doesn't need the T there. It just needs the 1400 to plug in to find our DWDT, which is what we're going to need for slope. Right? Slope is our rate of change. Okay, so DWDT at 0, 1400, but we're only going to use 1400 because there's no um, requirement for T on the right side. We use our calculator to uh, get that down to a number, and our slope is going to end up being 44. Okay, so we have our order pair, we have our slope. We can now build our tangent line equation. Let's get that W by itself just by moving that 1400 over. Okay, now we can do our, our linear approximation, right? Plug one fourth in for T, and then that will get us our linear approximation, right? Because linear approximation is all about, let's build the tangent line equation, and then whatever decimal or number that we're trying to approximate on that line, we're just going to insert that in. But just an approximation, so we'll do a squiggly line. We're just plugging one fourth in for T and getting whatever um, the amount of waste is going to be. Um, three months after or three months into 2010. So that's going to end up being 1141 tons. It's just an approximation um, based off of our rate and our time period. Obviously, the closer that we are to um, zero, the better our approximation is, but we don't have to worry about how accurate our approximation is. We just do whatever the problem is asking us to approximate. Yeah. Uh, 1411. Sorry, say it again. Uh, yes, sorry, thank you. Yeah, I've missed copy. OK, part B, uh, find D2W over DT2 in terms of W. So that's asking for the what? Second derivative, yeah. So use second derivative to determine whether your answer in part A is an underestimation or overestimation um, uh, from. So basically, what we basically want to know is this uh, concave up or concave down, right? If it's concave up or concave down, we know our linear approximation is either going to sit above the curve or below the curve. And if it's above, it'll be over approximation. If it's below, it'll be under approximation. Okay, so let's see if we can build our second derivative. So again, here's our dwdt. I'm just going to multiply the uh, multiply this through. Okay, so this is my first derivative. This is basically I'm just um, taking the equation that's given to me. I'm just um, distributing that uh, 125 1 over 25 through. So now let's find the second derivative. So second derivative dw dt becomes d2w over dt2. And now let's find the derivative. What's the derivative of 1 25th w? 1 25th. Now this with respect to time here. So w will turn into a dw dt. Yeah. Minus, and this becomes what? Zero. Yeah. So 
our second derivative which is 1 25th of dw dt. So we can just replace dw dt back in terms of um, Now this is at the same time period here, right? So my DWDT from part A is just 44. And that's greater than zero. So this must be what? Concave up. So if the graph is concave up and I'm doing a tangent line approximation, this approximation is gonna be what? Over or under the actual value? Under, yeah, under approximation, yeah. Approximation will underestimate since W of T is concave up. Okay, part C is where our work is going to, uh, majority of our work is going to be, because we're now going to solve this differential equation. Uh, find a particular solution to differential equation with initial condition W0 equals 40. So uh, we, go, we go through this process of separating our variables, right? I like to have two fractions lined up, cross multiply. Instead of Y's on the left and X's on the right, we now are gonna have what? What's on the left now? What's gonna be our dependent variable now? W is on the left, yeah, and then what's on the right? T's, yeah, so we just have to kind of get used to that. I know we're used to X's and Y's, but we have to also be comfortable with um, understanding that, okay, if I don't see X's in the problem, it'll be T. T is going to be my quote unquote X, and whatever the other variable that that is not uh, P is going to be, or that's whatever the other variable is, that's going to be your dependent, that's going to be your Y. Okay, so here's part C. And the parentheses are there to help us, so. I'm gonna, I would like to have this as a clean fraction equaling a fraction, so let me do this. Okay, so now I'm going to cross multiply, and eventually the cross multiplying is not going to separate the variables necessarily, but it will at least get the denominators out of the way. Okay, everybody good so far. All right, now do we have uh, full separation of variables? And if we don't, what do we have to move that you see? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we move that? That's going to end up in the denominator. Okay. Um, there's one more thing that we don't have to move, but I think it's helpful if we can move it. What else would be helpful to move? Yeah, 25, it's not wrong if you do the 25 there, but eventually everything has to be on the right side anyway, so I'm gonna also move that. We're also gonna do what with that 25? Divide it, yeah. So they're, these are both gonna switch places, and they're also going to um, be in the denominator. So we're gonna divide 
these out and we're going to make them move to the denominator on the other side. Does that make sense? The important thing is that we want to make sure that our DW and DT are lined up in the numerator, right? So those are our anchor variables. We don't want them to be in, in the wrong places. It's OK to have everything else in the denominator, but we don't want to have these ever in the denominator. So when you cross multiply, you at least have these two lined up well. You don't have to worry about uh, moving them anymore. Um, but we do need to move that 25 and W over minus 300. OK, so here's DW over W minus 300 is equal to ET over 25. OK, now we have full separation, right? W is on the left, T is on the right, or and anything else on the right. Now, this one here, we got to go through a little bit of what? Yeah, U substitution, right? What's our U value? Good, yeah, so you, but it, it'll end up being one over U, which is natural log, right? You already know what's gonna show up. You don't have to go through this whole step, but. It's gonna end up being one over u du, which is natural log absolute value of u, and then I can replace the u back in terms of w minus three hundred. Now the right side is just what. Or if I make it more obvious, if I can pull that one over twenty five out and make it one dt, that's just t, right? That's just power rule. One becomes t. The one twenty fifth is just going to stay in front. Okay. So here's my updated equations on both sides. Left side, I'm going to do natural log, but then bring back the W. So I'm going to go back to the top here. Natural log absolute value of W minus 300 is equal to 125th T plus C. OK, our calculus is done. Now we just have to worry about two remaining things. We got to solve for C and we got to solve for W. Okay. I'm going to solve for W first. I like to get that natural log out of the way. Um, if I could, if I could solve for C now, it just feels a little messy having to deal with the natural log here. So I'm going to wait for that to, to come later. Now, ultimately, that's your decision. You can solve for W first or solve for C first. Um, if you solve for C at a different point than me, your C may be different than mine. But ultimately, at the end. We're going to be in agreement. Okay. It's just sometimes for certain problems, I have certain preferences. So I'm going to solve for W first, get that natural log out of the way. So what can I do to get rid of that natural log? Yeah, face E, right? E and natural log will cancel out. I can split this up E to the 125th T, then what? How can I split this up? Times get times e to the c, and that's because we're using this property here. A to the m plus n can be split up into a to the m times a to the n. So that's addition at the exponent level is going to become a multiplication at the base level. Okay. What do I know about e to the c? That just becomes what? The C. Yeah, I can pull that C out in front. I can drop the absolute value at the same time because I know C will just absorb all the plus or minus that's going to come from the absolute value. And now I can solve for W. So W is equal to C E to the 125th T plus 300. So there's my general equation. And then I have an order pair. That I can use to solve for C. Right. So the order pair uh, that we have is uh, the initial condition. We know that initially at time zero, there's 1400 tons of waste. So we can use that information to help us solve for C. Once we solve for C, then we can update the C and we can rewrite our specific equation. What's going to happen here? E raised to the zero power is just going to be what? One. Yeah, so it's going to be C, right? And I can just subtract that. 
Um, 300 over. Once I have my updated C, go back and rewrite your equation with your C updated. Let's see if we can try page 14 together. I'm going to have you guys try it on your own. I'm going to work through it at the same time that you guys are working on it. It's basically the exact same process. You can start with linear approximation. Then it's asking about the second derivative, concavity. Then it's going to move into solving differential equation where you separate your variables. Yeah. What do you for like the bottom left? Oh, sorry. Okay. So you have one of these. Um, you have a Riemann sums. Uh, for your uh, on your quiz next week, and you'll have a different equation. So those are the two um, FRQs that you're going to see next week's quiz. What's the expert? Oh yeah, part B. Underestimation. Underestimation because it's concave up. You want to say the exact value? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I need to say that the second derivative is positive. That's all we need to know the thin cavity. Okay, so let's spend like 10 minutes, see if we can get through page 14, and I'll work through it at the same time that you guys do.
So they're giving us some in, uh, information about the second derivative or to help us with the second derivative. They tell us that X is greater than zero and F of X is greater than zero. So if X and Y are both positive, then that means for our second derivative, no matter what numbers I plug in, as long as X and Ys are positive, I'm always getting a positive number in return. So if my second derivative is always positive, that means the graph is concave up. And my graph is concave up, I know that this linear approximation is going to be under because concave up and linear approximation uh, will interact in a way where that tangent line is always going to produce a value that's lower than the actual value on the curve. Part C, we're going to separate our variables and Y is on the left, X is on the right, take our antiderivative, solve for Y, solve for C. When you cross multiply, your dy dx's are going to be lined up nicely. There's no need to touch them, but there's one thing out of place. What do you see is out of place? Yeah, move that to the denominator on the left side. Yeah. Okay, how would you handle this problem on the left side? I do want to point something out here. There's only one variable here, right? There's no need for use substitution. Use substitution is good for more complicated problems. Um, so what rule would you use for dy over yq? Our rule, right? Why is this not natural log? I mean, variables in the denominator. What's wrong with the natural log rule? Why not say natural log of y cubed? What about the exponent? It tells us that this is power rule and not natural log. For natural log, this has to be what degree? One, yeah. If it's dy over y, then we'll go through natural log. But if it's dy over y squared or y to the one half or any of the power, we got to bring it up. We got to go through power rule, right? So there's a place and time for natural log. We do natural log because power rule is going to fail if this y to the first power is going to end up giving us a zero in the denominator. But if it's any other power, we bring it up to the top, we go through power rule. And the right side is also power rule. So they're both power rule, but the left side is going to require a little bit of rearranging. Okay. Comes up to the top as what? Y to the negative three. And add one to the exponent. And now let's just do some cleanup. So I think this is a relatively easy equation where you'll have a lot of messiness along the way. I'm going to go ahead and solve for C. Once I solve for C, I'll come back to this and figure out a way how I can um, get that Y by itself. So I have an order pair, initial condition one, two.
I got negative three fourths. Oops, sorry, this is a uh, one eighth. OK, so back to my equation where I started making my substitution there. And I can quickly get rid of the negative and the one half. I multiply everything through by negative two. Sorry. Um, X squared over two, not. Now this looks a little messy here because that y squared is in the denominator, but what I can do is I can flip both uh, the left and the right side to get that both sides to be in the right places. So I'm going to flip the left side, make that y squared come up, flip this one, make it one over negative x squared plus five fourths, and then just take the square root. And because I think the square roots, my look at my y value, my y value is positive, so that means I want the positive square root. Looks a little messy, but this is this is uh, acceptable. It'd be a negative question. The square root the square root of y would be negative. Will be positive because my y value in my original condition is is positive. Okay, come get your phones. Uh, tonight's homework. You guys will try to finish um, eleven through fourteen. Page eleven through fourteen. Yeah, I'll have it here. Yeah, Great, thank you. Thank you. 